Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode number 88 of the Peer Geek Podcast. And as always, it's an absolute pleasure to have you here. Now, I'm really excited to be recording this shorter than normal episode. It's probably likely to be. And it's all centering around a topic that, you know, you may not think has anything to do with phys ed or anything to do with, um, you know, your day-to-day uh, life. But I, I think it really does. You know, we're, we're moving to a world that is more and more connected and part of the stuff that we do online and particularly the stuff that I advocate for being, you know, digital tools and so on um, comes with a level of susceptibility to all sorts of things that can go wrong from, you know, hacking and uh, mal attempts to steal your data and, and all sorts of things. And uh, even though they don't directly impact your um, your profession, they may impact you personally if you ever get down some of these horrible situations. And I wanted to prepare an episode because I do see this happen a lot with people emailing me and talking to me and um, you know, I, I get a lot of emails from the different tools that we run and the different apps and so on, where people are having trouble with their uh, with their passwords, and where you know they basically are using passwords that just won't reach the bare minimum of um, password security strength, and asking if I can make it easier for them to create a password that. Um, will let them fill out the form or whatever it may be. And, you know, I thought it would be a good idea to dive in, record this episode and share some of the different things that you should be really mindful about when creating passwords, some of the best practice around that so that you can hopefully never have a situation where, you know, someone is able to get into your accounts or utilize, um, you know, whatever it is that you're, keeping protected with those passwords. Now, I will say straight out the gate that just because you have a secure password is not the be-all and end-all for you ever, potentially never having one of these situations occur. But it is definitely a step in the right direction. And we'll talk about some of the other um, facets that you can add to a password to make it uh, even more secure. And then how I deal with a multitude of other situations that... um, you know, confront you daily and what you can do to also sort of make it a little bit easier to manage these security and these situations that may happen uh, in your day-to-day life. So let's dive into this episode. Now, obviously, all of us have passwords for different things. And, you know, some of these probably have connection with different things in our life to help us remember those. And, um, you know, so that we aren't sitting there and trying to log in and having to reset our passwords. We, we probably have passwords that we use uh, all the time for, for various uh, services. And some of these passwords are incredibly important, like uh, your bank details and so on. And uh, it's probably likely that you've put in a variation of something common that you use and you may add in a special character and a number or something to to make it match the required minimum of whatever that service or entity is that you're signing up for. But uh, in reality, this is probably not good enough. And, you know, just to give you a bit of an idea, the the top 10 most popular password types um, around tend to fall into categories such as a pet's name, a significant date, wedding anniversaries, etc., birthdays, kids' names, family members' names, uh, your birthplace, favorite holidays, your football or sports teams, um, partners' names, or in fact, as terribly as the word password. Uh, these are, are common constructions of popular passwords that people use. And you know, the common practice would be to put in your kid's name and then some number that might be their, you know, their birth date or your birth date. Um, but the problem is using this sort of approach, it really sort of uh, minimizes the amount of time that it would take for someone to use a brute force attack and get access to whatever your details were. In particular, if they happened to find other bits of information that they could use, such as, you know, um, emails or other, you know, letters or correspondence that had your name and your you know, partner's name and kid's name on it, then this information sort of drastically reduces the amount of time that they need to effectively get access to your material. Now, one of my favorite websites is howsecureismypassword.net. 
And you can go there and, and you type in your password. It doesn't actually like capture your other details. It's just you put in your text that you use for your password and it will tell you the amount of time that you need to generate um, or a computer would need to hack that using a brute force attack. Now, uh, basically, a brute force dictionary attack is the computer that's doing the cracking running through a script of, firstly, popular passwords that people use and then um, just trying them over and over and over and um, and then, yeah, eventually getting a result. Now, the good thing about a lot of these services that we sign up to is that they simply would not let you do a brute force attack on them. So for example, if you get, you know, three or four password attempts, it might lock you out for a period of time. So with that being said, it, it's there's a lot of protection built into our services that we use these days that goes to protect us. But I still find it fascinating because, you know, the password that I used for many, many years that I thought was, you know, I thought it was brilliant. It was a variation of a couple of things and it had some special characters and uh, numbers on it. You know, if I typed that into how secure is my password.net, um, it, it quickly worked out that it would only take about a minute for a computer to hack that password, um, which isn't a lot. Now, like I said, brute force attacks aren't going to happen on um, web-based services because the servers would probably recognize that and lock out whoever it was that was doing it. But your computer um, very well easily could be locked by one of these passwords and very quickly it could be opened up and then obviously all your other passwords are stored inside that. So um, it's, a, it's a serious concern. But if you simply take a variation and, and add in a special character, just another special character to the one that I had Previously, it takes it from one minute to one day. And if I put in, you know, another number, you know, it goes to two months. And I put in another special character and all of a sudden it's at 11 years. Um, put in, let's say, two more characters uh, and we're at exponential sort of time now in terms of it would take two million years for my um my password, which now is comprised of 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14 characters, it would now take 2 million years for it to um, be cracked. So the real lesson here is that it's not really a combination of um, difficult word or you know complex structures that make a password secure it is the length and this comes from all sorts of academics and people who are specialists in security and a longer password is usually better than a more random password um, something is like 12 to 15 characters long in fact even longer passwords that are all lowercase can be way more beneficial than trying to come up with some sort of alphanumeric gibberish that um, is a shorter password. So what you should really be doing is trying to come up with some sort of even word or phrase that you can easily remember that um, strung together is a, quite a long sentence and then uh, it becomes quite secure. So basically to test that, if you had a, a series of words, um, you know, apple, banana, pear, Apple banana pear strung together is 51 years. And if you just kept putting together a series of words and chunked them um, and created what's more commonly known as a pass phrase, then you would exponentially increase the difficulty of that password and um, all of a sudden you've got a very secure password. So apple banana pear plum would take 23 million years to crack. And it's just a combination of words um, together. Now you might be saying, well, what about just using, you know, all my kids' names or my, all my family members' names? Probably not smart because anyone who is trying to leverage and get your identity may be able to easily get access to those things. So try and keep it weird and try and keep it long. And, um, you know, if, if you can keep it memorable with these passphrases, then it's certainly going to serve you really well. Now, a couple of other little tips um, that you should consider is don't um, bunch special characters you know put them throughout if you're going to use them put them throughout but they're not as important as keeping it long 
uh, make sure you change them often. Not too often, but try and change them often so that you know, if, if for whatever reason people are able to find out, then it's it's going to be you know changed by time by the time that they get around to hacking it. Um, and yeah, try you know try and layer up your password logging in. So what I mean by that is, if the service that you're using offers two step sort of login, you need to make sure you put that on. And two step would be. You enter your password into the bank and your bank sends you a text message and you've got to put a code in because that exponentially, again, makes it much more difficult for you to be hacked because now the person needs to have your phone, they need to have whatever it is to log into your phone, they need to know your password and they need to be in that time and place for for that to happen and that's far less likely than just having a password. So any service that you can do, you should do and you should turn it on. Now, one of the, I guess, biggest risks that we take outside of using really basic passwords is authorizing other websites to log in and give our information. And we basically do that all the time. Whenever we log in with Facebook or log in with Twitter or log in with any of these other services that um, you can say, all right, log in with Facebook and then all of a sudden you've created an account you've not had to enter in your details. Um, You know, it's, it's really quite good, but it's also a risk. So if you want to check out what services you've enabled with Facebook, then all you need to do is to log into Facebook and you need to, in the top right, hit the little drop down and select settings. And then you can go and click on apps and you can see all of the services that you've enabled so that you can create um, an easy account. Now, most of these will actually be quite good in that they only, the only information they were after was your email address. Um, but some of them are more robust in that they're actually after your friends lists. They're after all sorts of stuff so that they can uh, invite f- your friends to whatever it is that you're, the service that you're using. Um, you know, the common thing is games on Facebook or whatever. All of a sudden you get invites from those game places. And while they may be a little bit annoying when you keep getting Candy Crush invites or Farmville invites from your third cousin, but the problem is that over time we build up this complete library and database of people that we've said, okay, they can find out more about us um, and that can get out of control and we should definitely go and audit them from time to time just to make sure that we still know who those services are and turn them off if we decide that they no longer need access. So I've logged into my Facebook backend right here and I've authorized 225 applications or websites or services to use um, to use my account. Now, in most cases, all they're after is quite literally the name and uh, of my account, my, my personal details, so that they could create a profile for me quite quickly. Um, But, you know, that's probably not even needed for many of these services. You know, I look through them now and quite a few of them no longer exist as services. So I probably can go through and revoke quite a few. And if it turns out that I still need some, the next time I go to use that service, you know, it's not too difficult to be able to resume. So that would be the first little advice for you to go and check out is go and check what services are connected to Facebook, what services are connected to Twitter, review whether you actually need those services um, anymore. And the other, you know, action item would be to go and have a think about your passwords and put them into that how safe is your password um, dot net and find out whether or not adding a few characters would increase the difficulty of those passwords being cracked. Uh, And aside from that, adding in a a two-step function so that you get a text message whenever you try to log into a important service. Now, aside from that, obviously there is a lot to think about. There's a lot to remember. And, you know, as we know, it's not good practice to use the same password on all your sites. So a common thing that people will say to me is, you know, I, that's great, Jared. You know, it's, it sounds good, but I don't want to have to remember 52 different websites passwords because I've tried to make them all different I've tried to make them complex enough and now I just spend all my time trying to remember my passwords so to prevent that 
I, you know, I write them down in a little file and I hide it in my computer or it's written on a piece of paper and it's stored in a, um, in a cupboard at home. And I mean, that's possibly the worst thing that you could do. And, and I mentioned that because that's exactly what my mum was doing. You know, she was creating these passwords for different entities and she just had them stored uh, in a cupboard in, in, in the house so that if someone randomly um, managed to come into our house, they would see bank the password for it and it was it was very it wasn't even cryptically sort of presented so that a random eyes would not be able to tell what it was it was it was written in a way that anyone could pick it up and log it in and i don't think she's alone with that there's lots of people that have similar practices uh, maybe a word file on their computer where they store their passwords and um, you know literally all it takes is someone to search on your computer for the word password and that file comes up and then all of a sudden they're in it. It's really just not smart at all. So there's a couple of tools that I use that make it easy for me to store a variety of passwords across all the services I use, but most importantly, um, keep it safe. And the, the tool that I've blogged about before, it's called LastPass. And LastPass, you can get as a free account I have the paid version, which has a few features that I'll talk about in a moment. It works out to be about $20 a year or something, uh, Australian. Not much at all. Or an equivalent tool is 1Password with a number 1. They both do the same thing, and there's a few others like Dashlane, etc. But I find that a lot of people are either using LastPass or 1Password, and they both really do the same thing. So what they do is you install the password extension in your browser. So for me, it's LastPass and I have a little extension that sits in my browser so that every time I'm browsing sites, um, it's accessible. Now, if you register for a new service or a new website, what it will do is prompt you and say, would you like to save this password? So the minute you've registered, it will pop up and say, um, website URL, you've put in your email address, whatever details you use to register and your password that you entered has been captured and you say save and it stores it in your password vault uh, as it's known on LastPass. Now that password vault has a variety of different um, features because it will store all of your passwords under one master password account. So you unlock your password vault by logging in with a password that's your master password and in that you get access to all of the sites that you've stored in your vault. Now it's usually at this point people say, well, that doesn't sound very smart because uh, if someone gets a hold of your vault password, then all they need is that and they can log in and find every password that you've got. So how is that any better than having just a piece of paper um, you know, sitting in your house? But the answer would be that it's much safer because if someone did happen to get a hold of your vault password, and they logged in on their computer or their phone or wherever it may be, they would still have to have your mobile phone so that when the passcode came through, they could enter that in. Now, let's just say, for example, they did have that. They were sitting at their computer. They'd stolen your phone. They had your pass vault. They logged in. They got their PIN code that came through on the text message, and they typed that in they would still not be able to get into your vault because LastPass or the other services that um, you subscribe to that do this would recognize that their computer was not your computer and it was a completely different device and it would send you an email to basically click a button and confirm that Um, you had actually authorized those things to take place. So it's pretty much a three-step process then that, you know, if they didn't have access to your email or whatever it was, then, you know, they wouldn't be able to click that. So at the end of the day, it's the three-step approach that really protects the passwords. Um, And if, you know, somehow, whatever reason, they still manage to get in, then it's pretty unfortunate um, because you could go and reset your password for your master vault and then obviously you would protect all the passwords that were inside it. So LastPass has been really quite amazing for me. The, the best part about it isn't that everything is secure, it's that I never need to type passwords in. So once it's in my vault, if I ever end up back at that site and I hit the login button, it'll automatically pre-fill my 
uh, email and my password and I just have to hit sign in. I don't even need to know what the password is for that site. And in fact, most passwords that I use for websites, I don't even know what they are. So when I'm signing up for the service, I will use LastPass to generate a 32 character long password of, of um, you know, random words and phrases. And that will become my password that gets saved in the vault. And then whenever I go to use it, I don't even have to see the password. I just need to know my password vault, which is a nice long password. And then I have these random passwords for every single service. And in fact, some of my passwords are so long that I've signed up to a few services and they've actually said, can you please use a shorter password? Because the password I'd entered was too long and complex. So the answer to most of the questions that we've spoken about today is to start using a password manager. Um, I use LastPass, 1Password, Dashlane, quite a few of them that you can use that also work on your phone so that no matter what device you're on, you've got you know, the ability to log into places seamlessly. Uh, it's a really exciting time in terms of being able to ensure that your safety is as safe as possible. Um, at the end of the day, nothing is guaranteed. Uh, and you need to obviously exercise some common practice in there as well of, you know, if you do use these services, then don't just leave your phone sitting out open and ready for someone to come in um, and use it. The other, you know, cool aspects of most devices these days is that they often require, you know, some biometric login as well. Um, obviously, my phone uses my my fingerprint to open it up. And, you know, no matter what, no one's going to be able to really get that unless they can get a copy of my fingerprint somehow. So we're getting to a point where it's becoming a lot safer to, to work online. But unfortunately, many of the people that I talk with and speak with are still using practices that are just not going to cut it in today's day and age. And it's just far too important. You don't want to be in a situation where you've lost um, your account to someone who's interested in doing you harm um, because that's just going to impact your day-to-day -day, Your and then obviously your teaching. You're just going to feel like... Um, it's the worst possible thing that could happen because more and more stuff that we do these days is invested in and connected to digital devices. So it's critically important. Go and get it right. If you're sitting here and you've listened to this and it's um, sounded obvious, great. You know, hopefully you've you're already using many of these um, practices in your life. But I know that there are plenty of people that are not. So. The takeaway is to really go and actually act on what I've mentioned here. I mean, I'm not an expert, but I'm just talking about things that I've implemented in my life that have made it easier for me to manage complex passwords and stay more secure. And um, that's something that you can do too with a password manager and just with some common practice around not using the same passwords for each site, using longer words, even if they're very simple chunked phrases um, together and just ensuring that you know you regularly update it um, as you need to. Okay, hopefully that's been useful. Um, as always, you can get a full word for word transcript over at thepeageek.com forward slash the episode number. So if you're listening to episode 88, then slash 88, and you can get um, the transcript and all the show notes and links to things that we've spoken about. If you have any questions, then you can also download um, the mobile apps and contact me or press the contact chat button on the page that you might be listening to this podcast on. There's a million different ways to contact these days and I'd be more than happy um, to answer your questions. So we'll speak soon and I look forward to seeing you again in the next episode. Bye.